This is a genuine t-shirt as used by Intel around the launch of the Pentium 2. Hello everybody, I'm High Treason. And since my last video, I was working on another overview of one of my old workstations, but there were a lot of problems during production and everything that could go wrong did go wrong, as it always is with these things. So I kind of cobbled it together as best I could, but I wasn't happy with it. But there was one good thing that came out of that, is that this would have been the follow-up video to it. So I figured, well, what I can do is I can just mesh the two videos together somehow and make one good one. And yeah, that's what I'm about to do. So obviously we have to cover what I covered in that video, so everything in this apparent follow-up video is relevant. Uh, the first thing I did was to tell a small story about the history between me and the computer that was looked at in the video. So we should probably take a look at that first, right? Around a decade ago, I didn't own a very powerful computer. It was a modest machine with an AMD Duron 750 installed, and not really a lot of anything else, so to speak. It was a good system, but it was ageing and it was nearing its retirement. I don't have that machine anymore, sadly. It died a horrible death. These are the only pieces I have left, and they don't work. But I can't bring myself to throw them out for some strange reason. I went in search of a cheap system to use on the side, so I could still do things whilst the system was busy rendering videos, most of which are on this dead hard drive. I found this. It was cheap and it was from the 1990s, but it seemed likely to have enough power. It used to live in a different case, but that was cheap and nasty and fell to pieces. It's because of this machine that I build the way I do now, that I use the parts I use now. This one taught me what I was doing wrong. The system actually scared me a little because despite the age gap, despite upgrading the Duron to 950MHz and even 1800MHz before the end of its life, it would still almost keep up with it in certain tasks. Of course, with an overview and all, it was quite important that we had a look at the hardware in the machine as well. I suppose we should do that now. My Pentium 2 used to live inside this case, and it's a good quality case, which takes six screws to remove the cover. With that removed, the internals don't look too strange at first glance. There's an R64 value down there, which provides good sound and compatibility. You may notice the PC speaker cable is attached to this card. There's also a TV card. It's the WinTV Express I used to use for this channel. But I was using a BT848 base card before. Here's something I recorded with that one, in case you wonder what it looked like. Above these is a 3COM 3C905CX Ethernet card, which does have a boot ROM installed. Finally for the cards is an ATI Radeon VE, essentially a low-end Radeon 7000, before that's what they actually called it. At the time, my Duron was running a Radeon 7500. Neither of them were particularly impressive, even at the time they were new. The machine originally had an early DVD drive installed, but that was later upgraded to this Pioneer DVD rewriter, which cost over £300 back when I bought it. It has a fan installed in the back of the drive, and I'm not sure what that does for dust, but as it has trouble reading the discs now, I'd be willing to bet it's probably not good. Have you noticed I'm doing this in a strange order? Well, here are the hard drives, and these are the first sign that something abnormal's going on in here. Because as you can see, there's a floppy disk drive there, a rubbish Maxter IDE hard drive, and then this ribbon. And that certainly isn't IDE. Nope, it's Ultra 2 SCSI LVD, or low voltage differential if you prefer. The hard drives that are using this bus are Quantum Atlas 10K3 drives with a capacity of around 36 gigabytes each. I originally used these 18GB Western Digital hard drives, but whilst restoring the system I found that one of them had dead sectors, possibly due to the original bi-directional cable being faulty. The drive may be recoverable, but I found it would be easier to replace the drives with these and give them a single directional cable. 
The last few pieces of the machine that are worth looking at are that it has 2GB of 100MHz SD RAM installed somewhere behind that drive caddy. The original RAM I used was ECC, but eventually it failed, so I'm now using non-ECC, though the performance difference is marginal at best. Now think about what I just said for a moment. You are looking at an x86 computer from the 1990s that has to measure its memory capacity in gigabytes. How often do you even see that? That there is a Pentium 3 Katmai processor at 500MHz on a 100MHz bus. Its stepping is SL37D, in case you were curious about that. Here's the system's party trick. They all have one, but some are better than others. Some even have two. This has two. Two processors, that is. What is interesting is that it isn't unlikely that what's happening in here is closer to the modern dual-core Intel CPUs than the Pentium D in my current workstation. Another thing that's important in such a video is to actually start the machine up. Of course I did that. When the machine starts, things don't seem out of the ordinary besides that SCSI LED. Speaking of which, the SCSI hard drives then start up. And that's when you know this machine's serious. Those discs spin at 10,000 RPM. You can imagine what a large number of drives with staggered spin-up might sound like. This one was one of the last motherboards that I saw which used AMI win bias. That's quite a shame because I rather liked that. It was though one of the first boards I know of to have temperature and voltage monitoring that actually meant something. You can see here that the motherboard has overheat protection. Hey, did I mention this motherboard was made in the USA? Well, here's that alarm. Once at a LAN party I saw a man using the P6DGE, this motherboard's brother, and he was triggering a capacitor with a relay across the PS online, so that the machine would turn off if the alarm was triggered. Strangely, AMD used a similar method in some of their AMD Athlon processors. There's a lot to play with in the BIOS though, besides setting noisy alarms off. Now, if you're running XP, the power management section is completely useless as it doesn't work properly with this OS for some reason and it just ignores it entirely. The machine won't even work on LAN if I've been running Windows XP for some reason. Speaking of which, I have the machine set to dual boot, Windows 98 is installed on that IDE drive, mostly because the bootloader for XP won't start Windows 98 from a SCSI drive for reasons I do not know. What I intended to do was test it against a single socketed 1 GHz Pentium 3, and that was fine, but I also went to test it against the system I really wanted back in the day, an AMD Athlon 1400 with a Chaintech 7 VGL motherboard and a GeForce 4Ti. This is where things started to go wrong and I started to think I probably hadn't learned anything. The Athlon refused to boot and I reinstalled Windows just for the video. Same thing. I got it to start using a bootloader from a CD and benchmarked all three machines. Of course the Athlon won in CPU and RAM, though that was to be expected. It didn't win all tests though, and I hinted in the video that the Pentium 3 was not quite done yet. Because I think by winning in those benchmarks it hasn't defeated the dual P3 in any way at all. In fact, if anything, that's just made it angry and it's got an ace up its sleeve, possibly. It might even have two aces up its sleeve, who knows. But, yeah, that AMD Athlon is really kind of on borrowed time. And I'll be keeping the graphics card, but beyond that, I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. Well, those aces arrived. These are SL4BS processors. Unfortunately, the Supermicro P6DGU motherboard is only rated for 100 MHz bus and the CPUs are for a 133 MHz bus, so they'll only run at 750 MHz. I'm not done yet. There's a little known tweak that gets you 133 MHz. This board has now gone faster than it was ever intended to. We've achieved dual 1 GHz processors. This is probably about as fast as any 90s PC is ever going to go. What you have to remember is that at the time this machine was around, there was a lot of hype around the AMD Athlon. Nothing could touch it. Well, that begs the question that's been around for over a decade, doesn't it? Can a Pentium 3 beat an Athlon? It's time to settle this once and for all. 
all the other systems completed their benchmarks. So all I have to do is just test the Pentium 3 again. Unfortunately, Windows XP won't boot with the system in this configuration, so I can't run it at full speed. This is probably due to timing issues, RAM and the AGP bus. It's likely why the chipset never officially went this fast. It doesn't matter, I can get 840MHz out of it, and we'll see how it fares now. I've sped up the benchmarking footage. Okay, all tests completed, and um, I won't upload it via the Passmark service, however as they're appearing in this video you're going to know I'm not fiddling with my base lines, and I'll upload them in a zip file which you can find a link to in the description. Now, obviously the benchmarks are done, so I want to test it against the other machines, um, which can be done pretty easily by actually locating where I installed them, which is here. But you have to do it one by one. So we've got the Athlon, we have Maria, which is the single socketed Pentium 3, and um, we have, give me a moment, this thing when it was only running two 500 megahertz processors. Now there's the Athlon, actually we'll do it in a different order, there's the Athlon, and go, we'll see what order it turns up in. Okay, so you have this computer, the Athlon, uh, this on 500s, and the single socketed Pentium 3, which isn't a complete result. And as we can see here, the summary is fairly interesting there. Um, overall, this thing's actually just beating all of the machines. Imagine what it'd do at 1000 megahertz. Um, CPU mark is relevant and it is annihilating everything. The graphics tests are irrelevant as all the cards can be interchanged, they're AGP cards. Memory probably just proves DDR333 is a bit faster than SDR. And the disk mark is also irrelevant because this is SCSI and the other systems are all IDE. CD mark I'm not doing because we know the CD drive in here is broke. It's completely broke now, it won't read anything. I might be able to repair it. Of course, break down the results is what we should really do because that will tell a slightly different story than the single bar. The Athlon's red. This was blue when it was 500 megahertz. The single Pentium 3 is yellow and this is green. And overall the scores are 301 245, 153 and 399 in that order, as in Athlon, 500, 1000 and this. Uh, at Integer Math, or Integer, I can never pronounce it properly that, uh, we have 43 for the Athlon, 27 for the dual 500, 22 for the single 1 GHz and 46 for this current configuration. And we know it can go faster, and I'm not giving up on that. Uh, floating point, this was one area AMD have always had an advantage. It gets 250, and this gets 194. Uh, with the dual 500 it got 117, and the single 1 GHz Pentium 3 gets 90.7, uh, with a decimal point there. It's floating point math. <laughs> CPU, fine prime numbers. and. There's not a lot in it. The Athlon gets 72, dual 500s get 42, the single Pentium 3 gets 7, this gets 70.9. So there's barely more than 1.3 points in it between this and the Athlon 1400. Multimedia instructions, 0 0.76 for the Athlon, uh, 1.02 for the dual 500, and 1.69 for the current configuration. Compression. 491.9409.6732.0 and 688.4 so if you want to do compression get a single 1 GHz Pentium 3 I've actually seen this do a bit better than that before I think uh, when I tested it before but I'm not certain uh, either way it's beaten the Athlon on it and that's what's important in uh, this and encryption well, that single Pentium 3 wins that again, it gets 4.98, this gets 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2.52, 2
the Athlon is 2.26 and at 500 megahertz this was 1.5 um, it's pretty nice so we are just beating the Athlon again physics 17.1 for the Athlon 12.6 for dual 500s valiant effort there 18.9 for this string sorting having two CPUs probably always going to be an advantage AMD Athlons don't look to be very good at that 265 uh, dual 500s 300 so it was already winning the single socketed Pentium 3 gets 299.4 this gets 447.2 in large RAM there's no question about it two processors and two gigabytes of RAM is always going to win against one gigabyte of DDR333 even if it is only SDR so 64 for the Athlon and 90 for this disk mark is really interesting and uh, as much as the SCSI controller doesn't rely on the CPU boosting those seems to have made a marginal difference um, I mean you can see even with the slower processors that blue bars way out in front the yellow bar will disregard because I think the hard drive in the single P3 is a bit sick but the Athlon one's quite new and that's Ultra DMA 66 I believe uh, this motherboard only does Ultra DMA 33 on its IDE controller so you've got 95 for the Athlon, it's 95.9, we'll call it 96 to be nice to it and 335 for this and what I'm going to do, I'm going to change, uh, I'm going to create a baseline, zip them up and you can download them for yourself, although if you're running a different version of Passmark I don't know what will happen, 840 megahertz configuration and let's dump it in the netshare folder so I can get it back well there you go you can beat an AMD Athlon with a Pentium 3 just as long as you have two Pentium 3's oh, and that is like discounting the fact that those processors cost $999 each at the time of release but that's nowadays there's not much difference and if I was me now back then I'd probably actually go for a Pentium 3 because I've had more than 10 Athlon machines over the years or 10K7 machines at least and out of all the machines I got that still work that Pentium 3 is still running I don't see any Athlon machines around here that are working so you know is it worth was it worth paying that extra well maybe who knows anyway yeah hopefully someone found that interesting I mean that was a bit of fun for me that's something I've always wanted to do you know, I've always wanted to mess about with that it's a shame we couldn't run the processors at full speed but maybe one day I will and I'm gonna keep trying at it when I get some spare time to mess with it I'm kind of done with that machine now it's taken me a year to restore and yeah I'm thinking maybe I'm gonna put some of the outtakes from that the video the really crappy one on the end here but otherwise I'm High Treason I hope you've enjoyed watching this and I hope to see you again in the near future unless everything goes horribly horribly wrong which it probably will though my look I think I've got everything working now do that it's not going to happen however there is a strong line. Yeah, but then that got replaced with that motherboard, and that thing has never, ever worked properly. <laughs> it has never worked properly. You know, like it's an engineering sample or something. I don't care. I paid 400 quid for it, and it doesn't work. Oh, and excuse the bodge job on the headphones. Can't afford any more at this moment in time. Oh, come off it. I just removed my camera from the tripod, and the whole mount just fell to bits. Fuck's sake. Let's get this thing finished.